guess. I think a lot of people are in the same position at the moment. In any case, thanks to all of you folks who came out or like stayed at home today in this heat in Europe, at least it's super warm. That's why I'm in this room. It's super dark. I thought it would be the coldest room in the house. It turns out it is not. Um, so anyways, we're almost at the end of the AI for People workshop, two days of many different explorations into artificial intelligence. I believe this is the second or third to last session um, today. So thank you to all of you for, for joining us and for sticking out uh, this long already. Um, so the short title of my talk is Cultural AI. Um, the longer title is Mapping Cross-Cultural Visions on Artificial Intelligence, which basically touches upon the basic question of how in different cultures artificial intelligence is viewed uh, in different ways and what that means when we talk about ethical AI um, and how that changes perceptions. So my original plan was to talk specifically about actually one case study, um, which is about the, my chosen home of Japan. Um, but in the preparation for this presentation, I decided to expand this view actually a little um, to encompass other cultural visions on AI as well, because it's partially a, a personal choice because I've been doing a talk about Japanese perspectives on AI for the past year. Um, and it was time to move on. It was time to use that knowledge and expand it a little. Um, I will get into that actually a little bit later. Um, why exactly I decided to expand that because there was uh, uh, a kind of crisis of thought in the past few months. Um, that is actually part of um, explaining why we're talking about this today. Um, one second. I want to quickly give you a small overview of what to expect. Um, I'm going to start out with a little background about myself um, because we're talking about culture. I think it's quite important that you actually know uh, about my cultural background in order to um, like pick me apart afterwards that I'm totally biased on what I'm talking about today. Um, we're going to go in a little theory on culture and technology and how that fits to AI. And then I'm going to go into three case studies. The first one is um, Japanese visions on AI, um, which I've been researching since the past year. The second one is indigenous perspectives on AI. And the third one is Ubuntu perspectives. So from Southern Africa perspectives on AI. And um, I'm going to go into a little comparison afterwards, not only comparing the Japanese indigenous and Ubuntu perspectives, but also how they relate to like the mainstream Western centric perspectives that we have. Um, but actually before I'm going to get into uh, introducing my personal background, um, because we're talking about culture, I would like to do a little roll call in the chat and actually ask where you guys are from. And maybe there's actually people that might be directly related to the three case studies that we're talking about. Um, so I just want to be aware of that, not that I'm saying anything wrong. So if you would just write like your, your, where you're based or where you're culturally from in the chat, that would be great also just for us to know. Kaufungen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess that's a that's a that's a very good point. Um, culture works at different levels. Um, so if you talk about Wittenrode and German culture, there might be actually different layers um, to that, and um, those communicate with each other as well. We're not going to get into that specific uh, terms of culture a little bit larger scale. But I think it already gives us like a good idea. I'm seeing a few people from India, second generation Canadian from India, Iran, the US, African-American, Florida, 
um, I guess it's morning now on the East Coast, so we also have some people from, from the States and from, from the Americas joining, which is nice. I think in the earlier sessions, we, we didn't have that yet. So it's great. Thank you for joining in the early morning. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to go into my cultural background. So while I'm trying to be as objective as possible, uh, in this conversation, um, please take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. Please do not hesitate to like tell me I'm wrong or criticize me or open up a discussion um, that maybe I'm totally biased by my own culture and I should uh, see things in a different way. Very much open to having that conversation. So that being said, we'll get to the meme later. <laughs> Um, that being said, I personally grew up in Germany, on the countryside, close to Frankfurt, um, born to a German mother, who was a flight attendant and American father, who was a GI. So it's a very typical story in Germany after the Second World War. Um, after high school, I decided to go traveling for a year around Asia. And afterwards, I started studying Asian cultures and politics at the University of Bonn. During my bachelor's, I got the chance to spend um, one year in Taipei, in Taiwan, um, studying um, Chinese, like East Asian politics uh, and Chinese. And afterwards, I spent another year in Japan uh, for university. We also studied East Asian politics and uh, cultures in Japanese language. Um, since that time, 2012, I've been mostly living in Japan. Um, with a brief stint in the Netherlands for not even a year for my master's degree in international studies. Um, but basically since 2012, I've been more or less full-time in Japan. Since 2016, I'm the artistic director of New Tech Japan, which is a festival for electronic music and digital creativity. It originally stems from Montreal, which I guess is also quite uh, interesting in the connection later, um, as we had Mila, for example, earlier uh, presenting here or are they still coming sorry um and the mutech network uh, is now in seven cities around the the world so it was a preview to mila <laughs> um so mutech itself is not only a festival we also have like a strong conference program where we use the artistic lens to to think about uh, technologies in a in a critical sense um and as one of our curators put it like very nicely, we're trying to imagine our digital futures. So that's kind of where the meme comes in. Um, it's, uh, it's a running joke in, in our sector to work at the intersection of art and technology because it's so broad, it's almost meaningless to, to say it, but that's what it is in the end. Um, so why does that matter? In the past year, um, as part of the festival. So we've been running the festival in Japan since 2016. In Montreal, it's been 21 years today. Um, as part of the festival, we, like I said, we explore new technologies through the artistic lens in a critical way because artists often use those new technologies in a way that researchers and engineers never intended to, to use these new technologies. So they bring up a lot of the questions that we're talking about now, now, like bias and all these kind of things. Uh, artists already thought about this like a, a long, long time ago. Um, so it's always quite interesting to, to use art as an inspiration to critically um, consider the technologies that we're using. So in the past year, we've been uh, focusing, I mean, AI has always been the focus of the festival since, uh, uh, since 21 years, since the festival. It's called Mutech, M-U-T-E-K. There will be a next slide with the title um, right there. Um, so basically AI has been a topic since, uh, since a while already, um, especially AI and art, uh, but especially the last year we've been running a series of what we called a AI labs or AI and art labs, which originally were initiated by the Russian curator Natalia Fuchs, who first brought it to Gamma Festival in St. Petersburg. Um, a Russian festival that is quite similar uh, to Mutech. And then we followed up with another um, AI lab in Japan, which was last November. And then with the Mutech AI art lab, which was held in Montreal 
uh, last March. Um, I'm actually, I'm not sure if it always works too well to watch videos in the Google Meet. I'm just gonna show you like a few impressions, like two, three minutes of this video that kind of summarizes a little what we're doing in these AI and art labs. I'm not sure, can you hear sound of the video? Sound, not so much. Okay, I'm just gonna uh, uh, say some things then uh, while we watch the video. <laughs> also works well. Um, you can watch the video afterwards. It's like six minutes of documentary about what we've been doing. Um, yeah. Like I'm saying, Google Meet is not the best way to double stream videos from the internet through the internet. And I guess one more time through the internet. Um, but basically within these AI labs, we brought together uh, artists, curators, researchers, engineers, industry professionals to basically jointly work and develop new projects around the intersection of art, music and artificial intelligence. So the participants would join the lab came from very different cultural backgrounds, basically spanning the whole globe. We had people join us from Russia, of course, because it was in Russia the first time in Japan, of course, Canada, of course, because it was there, but also from other places like Albania, Mexico, Germany, Iran, I think the Netherlands, uh, Finland, um, Korea. I'm not sure we had like over 50 participants over the, the last year. So I can't recall all of them. Um, but what struck me the most personally from my personal interest, bringing these different people from different cultural backgrounds together uh, was how differently the participants would view artificial intelligence, um, which of course, to some extent might be like a personal view, especially when it comes to artists thinking conceptually, etc. But I also felt that there was a strong cultural uh, component. So this brought me actually, so while I was always interested in the topic of like culture and technology together with art, um, this experience from the last year really brought me into the topic of exploring AI and cultural visions on AI, which is actually like still a very uncharted territory. Actually, in general, technology and culture is a very, very uncharted territory. There's, um, there's not that much research. Uh, on that, um, which we'll also see further down in the, the presentation. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. This is just background and we'll get into theory uh, in a second when we, when we talk about culture, because that's a very good point. What, what is culture I actually came across that point as well. Um, so what I did in context of these AI labs was basically start researching at my own door doorstep, uh, which meant I looked into Japanese perceptions on artificial intelligence and uh, surrounding areas such as robotics and biotechnology, etc. cetera. Um, where there has been some research, of course, there's kind of this techno animist uh, perspective, which we'll discuss in a second. Um, and as part of my research, I did uh, a series of talks, which was called Are Androids the Better Humans? Uh, which is nagging at a quote from a Japanese roboticist called Hiroshi Ishiguro, who actually believes that androids are the better humans, um, which is quite interesting um, to think about. The last time I did this talk was actually during the public day of the Mutech AI Art Lab at Mila in Montreal. Um, so it's funny to see how the, how the circle closes. Um, the first few times I did this talk, I had a very kind of clear, great philosophical conclusion of how, how seeing things from a different perspective encourages to, us to look forward and yada, 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 and all these very philosophical thoughts. But um, when I did the talk the last time at Mila, I was standing there at the end of my talk and I, I kind of lost my point. I, I was at the end of my presentation and uh, the conclusion that I had before didn't really make sense to me uh, after all, which I think was a direct result of working with the artists together and just getting so many different uh, viewpoints on artificial intelligence that I really was lost at the point thinking like, what does it 
what does it all mean? What is the conclusion of this? What is the purpose of me uh, giving this talk? Um, and that got me thinking, and that's basically the result of the last few months. Of course, lockdown also helped to kind of have the time to think more about it. Um, but um, the presentation I'm doing today is kind of uh, an answer to my own question, what, what does it all mean? Or first step, it's not a, I don't think it will ever be fully answered, but uh, it's a first step to, to answering that question. So the, the major question that came up to me was the, the idea what, what to actually do with this knowledge. And I think that's a, that's a big problem um, when it comes to like philosophy and culture and these kind of things that um, also some of the works that um, are related to the three case studies that we're talking about. Sometimes there's so much out there and so like conceptual that it's actually so hard to see how can we employ this different knowledge? How can we use this knowledge to make better decisions? How can we use this knowledge to collaborate better, uh, to make AI more ethical, etc. So for, from my perspective, um, I, I originally thought I'm very into like introducing the, the idea of Japan. Um, that was the, the first focus, but thinking about it after a while it became quickly clear, clear to me that it's not that much that I'm interested in. Uh, um, we'll get to that in a second. Don't mind the slide for now. Um, so it quickly became clear to me that uh, what I'm interested in is not one specific cultural perspective, but how these different cultural sp perspectives um, can relate to each other. How can we put them in relation to each other? Not saying that one cultural perspective is better than the other, but what can we learn from each other? How can we find like modus operandi how to, to equally value the different kind of cultural um, backgrounds? So finding like a working mechanism that um, lets us embrace our diversity, but at the same time kind of form unity in our diversity, and that's specifically around uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and then the lockdown came, I had a lot of time to think. Um, so this was a very long introduction into to where I'm coming from and why we're holding this talk today. Um, we're going to get into some theory now. Um, we're also going to touch up on culture but first we're gonna go into STS studies. So after my talk at Mila, um, I was really uh, at loss what to do with, with, with the knowledge that I, that I generated. And um, I started reading um, in, in, a, in a topic area, science and technology studies, which actually works around that question of like, how is technology constructed? How do we construct meanings around technology, et cetera, et cetera. So stuck in Germany, I started getting into all the traditional STS readings, including the social construction of technology by Wiebke Beaker, uh, actor network theory, uh, Langdon Winner, who is criticizing all of that, um, and a lot of other, other kind of theories. But what really really struck me was, I mean, there, there were many things wrong <laughs> with, with what I read. Like, it was great to see that um, people think about technology not just as like an object, but actually as something that we as human beings construct meaning around and that meanings can be very different depending on where you're from. Um, so that's very, that's very important. But the, that theory that existed thus far is very much kind of reinforcing that technological determinism that they actually try to criticize because it's very descriptive. It's very trying to explain how meanings develop and oftentimes it falls into the same kind of deterministic narrative that it had to happen this way because it couldn't have happened another way. So that's a big kind of uh, uh, lack of criticism there. So lack of any kind of consideration for the social consequences um, of the construction 
of the meaning of technology and also a general kind of lack um, of the human experience or taking any kind of moral stance regarding these technologies. So it was really focused on describing how it happens, but it didn't say, is this something that is, uh, is this something that we want? Or is this something that we don't want? Is there different ways? Um, very much in reinforcing the, the old narrative of, of determinism, basically. Um, but STS provides really a great toolbox to analyze technological developments in general uh, and paired with uh, other theories, um, which is happening more recently, for example, using STS in combination with feminist theory or decolonial critical theory and combining them with the toolbox um, uh, of the science and technology studies actually becomes very interesting because you can, you can you work with a theory that kind of has a certain world view and adding the toolbox of science and technology studies to that becomes very interesting and results of that work um, we're going to look at some afterwards uh, as part of the case studies but um, one big one that is in that direction is for example race after technology by Ruha Benjamin um, great book it really combines um, critical theory with science and technology studies. Uh, another one is algorithms of oppression, um, which I can also highly recommend, and uh, quite a few articles. Um, we actually have uh, a reading list on, on cultural AI as part of our um, cultural AI working group at AI for People. So I'm happy to share that to anyone who's interested, or maybe we can share it after the talk. Uh, it's just a summary of interesting readings that are representing a diverse view on, on cultural perspectives, on technology, on the internet, but also specifically on artificial intelligence. Um, and feel free to add anything. We have an open exchange uh, there. If there's anything you find interesting, you can just add it to the document and we'll expand uh, the list. Um, where was I? So, the, so that was one criticism of, of science and technology studies, that it's the, the lack for concern of like social consequences of moral kind of investigation. But for me personally, what really uh, struck me was the, the lack of cultural kind of concerns within the traditional science and technology studies. So of course they would go into the, the how, for example, the safety bicycle, there's a big study on how the safety bicycle was constructed uh, in the United Kingdom and which social groups worked into that and how they related to this uh, safety bicycle and how the process kind of uh, uh, developed. But it didn't say anything about cultures. So what would have happened if the safety bicycle would have been developed in India, for example? So the way the, the, the topic was treated before was that naturally it had to be that way because that's just the way it was and we just explained how it was. But in a different culture, the safety bicycle might have developed in a very different way because there were different cultural concerns that were important to that. And um, this lack of consideration that uh, things could have happened in a different way, uh, in a different culture, um, was very, very critical. Um, for me. I can understand why uh, it is a, a difficult topic, especially if you're not a cultural researcher, especially if you're like a, an engineer or even a politician or someone that doesn't really have culture as a focus. Um, because culture is a very tricky topic. <laughs> on one hand, it's like uh, so prevalent everywhere. On the other hand, it's so fluid and difficult to track. Um, if you talk about culture, um, it's easy to drop into like stereotyping, um, which we also don't want um, to happen. Um, so there's many pitfalls that can happen with, with cultural research. Um, and I can understand why someone who's not a cultural researcher uh, would try to stay away from that. And it's easier to kind of just go into explaining things for different kind of quantifiable reasons, especially. 
but um, but the lack of uh, concern for culture is actually that it just reinforces the existing structures um, that we already have, and that becomes quite dangerous. And we can see the results of that actually uh, around us every day. So when we talk about ethical artificial intelligence, without acknowledging the diverse cultural backgrounds of people that this discussion affects, it becomes very critical. So what actually defines ethical behavior is very different from, from culture to culture. And without acknowledging, understanding and implementing this, you cannot really reach truly ethical standards. So we actually tried that. History is like a, a great uh, teacher in that way. So we actually tried to have the, the Human Rights Declaration, which while claimed universally is actually a narrow product of uh, Western value system. So that's why we have such a difficult time to, to implement the, the human rights. Uh, not only because it's a product of the West, it's also that even if we agree or like other nations agree to the interpretation of certain rights, the interpretation of the rights themselves might be very, very different. So that's also a big point when it comes to, to ethical AI that um, we need to stress is that the idea of cross-cultural collaboration and agreeing on certain kind of standards on a, on a global level, um, if people agree for different reasons to the same kind of standard, the interpretation of that standard might be very difficult, uh, uh, might be very different. So we have to be very careful um, that we truly understand what the other person, the other culture means when we talk about a certain kind of um, principle, for example. So just because we agree doesn't mean that we actually agree on the same thing. And understanding that we might not agree on the same thing is very, very essential. Um, so on the other hand, um, I was criticizing before that someone who's not a cultural researcher might be having a difficult time. Um, but that's actually why people like me are here. Um, we don't expect people that are not cultural researchers to actually do the research on culture. But um, I think we need more exchange between um, social sciences and um, the natural sciences in general in order to better um, tackle these questions. So I'm going to take a sip of water. So I was complaining that science and technology studies doesn't care about culture. It's not entirely true. Like I was saying, especially recent works have been putting more attention to, to culture, um, but also this book, which was really influential for, for me, I have to say, Designs on Nature by the great Sheila Jasanov. Um, she did a case study on the, the framing of biotechnology and the, the policy making of biotechnology in Europe. So that means in Germany and in the United States. And um, um, she put a lot of emphasis on how the way that policy was made and um, how the, the technology was framed was a direct result of the different cultural backgrounds. So the, the questions of biotechnology um, at the time were quite similar in all the countries. There was the, the question of cloning, for example, or um, that was a similar question, but was very differently interpreted and thus very differently um, regulated in the three countries. So in the US, for example, being more libertarian, um, there was actually not much regulation at first and regulation was more made afterwards based on laws that already existed. Whereas in Germany, for example, regulation came actually very early um, and new laws were made, um, which she claims is a direct result of different cultures, especially political cultures. So political cultures uh, in this case means the way that uh, is debated, the way that decisions are made and the way that policies are implemented based on cultural um, questions. So I was very impressed with her work 
um, and how she picked the three different cultural backgrounds as influencing policy making, um, despite facing the similar issues um, they were talking about. However, this reading revealed three big questions to me. So the first question is actually the question that we just had in the chat, what the hell is culture? So I've been working with culture for, for almost 10 years now, but this work again kind of put it back. It's like, how do we define culture? How can we actually measure culture? How can we measure, the second question is, how can we measure the cultural influence um, on science and technology or on the construction of science and technology? And the third question is, what the hell are we going to do with this knowledge? Not only to describe things that already happened, but actually be practical about it and use the knowledge that we have in order to move forward and actually make better predictions and improve cross-cultural collaboration. So the first question, um, how do we define culture? Um, I was quite impressed with uh, Clifford Gertz's uh, work uh, on culture. Um, it's a little old, but I think the definitions are still valid in many, many regards. Um, the first quote on the definition of culture is, culture is a group's shared set of meanings. It's implicit and explicit messages encoded in social action about how to interpret experience. So I like this definition a lot because it uh, defines the self-reinforcing nature of culture. So the, mess, the meanings already exist, but they are encoded in social action and they lead to the reinterpretation of experience. And by that, it kind of reinforces the meanings that we already have. So if we're very conscious of this process of how this cultural experience is constructed, we can actually take it apart. So it's a first step to kind of understand that. The second quote that I find very interesting and also quite important because culture also, also works like in the first quarter set at a group level. So it also works as a denominator who is inside a group, who's outside a group or different groups that relate to each other, um, be it on a horizontal or vertical level. So the second quote says culture is how a mode of how things are viewed differently, how things are done differently, and how these activities are institutionally arranged differently between groups. So it's very broad, but I have the feeling we cannot narrow it down even more because it wouldn't benefit our, our analytic. Um, it does sound like language games concept from Wittgenstein. <laughs> so, the second definition really adds the idea of culture as a demarcation line for group insiders and outsiders or for the relationship between uh, two groups. And it becomes quite essential for, for our analysis. Um, and of course, in practical sense, it also becomes quite essential to, to understand the, the group relations to this. Um, for the second question, um, how can we use culture to, to analyze science and technology um, in general? Um, just enough started with the idea of, of political culture. Um, one second. I need to read the question one more time. I think it's better to talk about this now than later in the Q&A. Would you agree that culture is a dynamic and ever-changing repertoire of shared understandings inseparable from history, politics, and economics? Culture is definitely dynamic and ever-changing uh, repertoire of shared understandings. And it's definitely also inseparable from history. I'm actually not sure if inseparable from politics and economics. I mean, it's definitely connected to politics and economics. Um, but, I mean, it's a very broad definition. 
I cannot say if I agree or I disagree. I have to I have to think about the 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 politics and economics if they are It's hard not to acknowledge it included, but the question is, is politics and economics really essential in that? History, definitely. Politics, I would also say, if we talk about political culture in the sense of how we debate and how we, how we come to agreements. So that's actually very similar to the, to the social action that we were just uh, talking about. Uh, economics, I'm not necessarily uh, I'm not necessarily sure if economics actually plays into this. History, yes, because history is the, the self-reinforcing cycle that we talked about in politics, yes. That's the social action of debate and agreement that we're talking about. What about the economics of least developed world? How are we going to include more than 4 billion in the global level policy making? Well, that's a huge question. Um, I don't have the answer to that. We can gladly discuss that uh, in our Q&A session uh, afterwards. Um, but if I would have the answer, uh, uh, that, would be, that would be wonderful. I would love to have the answer to that question. <laughs> um, where was I? I was at the political culture, exactly. So when Justinov was uh, doing her analysis, um, for me, it was not always clear um, when is she talking about political culture? So I guess politics as we just talked, so the way of how, do, how we debate, how do we come to agreement, kind of a modus operandi of how we make decisions and implement decisions. And the other part, I guess, is actually it might be connected to the history um, that was just brought up, um, which I would call the cultural visions. So the shared set of meanings. So for, for, for me to better understand the way that culture works uh, in science and technology was really to, to separate these two. Of course, they have a common origin, but to separate the idea of political culture, how do we do things, and cultural visions, how do we view things? Um, and with cultural visions, I mean something, something specific. So cultural visions, of course, can be very broad, um, which then is kind of the, the, the top level where everything results from. But when I'm talking about cultural visions is um, the, the concrete set of meanings that, that we're talking about. So in this case, um, it would be the, the concrete view on how a certain culture views technology in general and how does it view more specifically artificial intelligence in general. So I think to, to have kind of a working analytical uh, toolkit, it's valuable, at least for me, to think of these two political, cultural and cultural visions as interlinked, but kind of separate levels of analysis. So further, it will become essential to, to also use this toolkit to look into the relation of culture, not only to science and technology, but also to the questions of power, for example, in order to reach a working uh, model of and a kind of critical foresight tool that we can use to analyze things. So it's not only power, you can add different kind of components to that. Uh, cultural analysis. And that's what people have been doing more recently, like I was saying in Race After Technology. It's kind of adding these components and combining um, science and technology studies with these other critical views. So this then directly leads into the question uh, number three of how can we make this uh, practical to use the knowledge that we have. So it is equally important to understand how AI is viewed in a certain culture, but also how this culture operates in terms of decision making, especially if we want to collaborate on like a cross cultural on a global kind of level. So only if we have at least some consideration to that, it opens up the space to explore where can we actually overlap and where do we differ in our perceptions on AI? How can we collaborate? 
when our understanding our certain way of decision making. So this for me is kind of the first step to really engage in, in cross-cultural collaboration. If you don't have at least some consideration for that cultural background on how decisions are made and how things are viewed, the, 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 the idea of something being ethical is already very much undermined in my personal opinion. I might be wrong. We can have a discussion about that. Um, in any case, we're actually working on this topic um, as part of uh, a research project for AI for People. It has the same name as this um, presentation, Mapping Cross-Cultural Visions on Artificial Intelligence. I will tell you a little bit more uh, about that uh, later on, but it's an ongoing kind of project that we're doing. Um, does anyone have any questions to the theory part? I know I talked a lot. We had some discussions already, but I think it would be a good time to, to add some additional questions before we actually get into to the case studies. No additional questions at the moment. Okay. Yeah, that, that question is, is, is huge. So I would like to keep that maybe for the end and we could open up the, the, the floor actually to the other participants as well. Um, it's a hard one and I don't want to claim to have any answer to that. So uh, let's keep that for the Q&A or the discussion around afterwards. Um, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, and drink some water. So for the following part, as I already mentioned, we're going to talk about uh, three case studies to introduce different, how different cultures might view artificial intelligence in a different uh, way. We're going to talk about Japanese AI visions, which is mostly based on uh, my own research and of course, people that researched it uh, before but um, a lot of my own experience living in Japan and working at the intersection of art and technology. Um, the second one will be indigenous AI, which is spearheaded by the indigenous protocol and artificial intelligence working group under the tutelage of professor Jason Edward Lewis of Concordia University in uh, Montreal. And then last but not least, Ubuntu perspectives on AI. Um, based on research by Sabelo Mhlambi, Mhlambi, sorry if I mispronounced the name. Um, he's a computer scientist, researcher, and fellow at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and a technology and human rights fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Um, I'm very specific about whose research I'm basing this on, um, because first of all, culture is a diff difficult topic. I don't want to take credit for anything that's, um, that's not mine and also not my cultural uh, background. Also, there's not that much um, research on these different ones yet. That's why you can really pin it down to like one or two researchers that are working uh, on this topic. Um, so one more time, disclaimer. I'm not an expert on indigenous AI and I'm not an expert on Ubuntu AI. I don't claim to be. Um, the perspectives that I'm going to, to repeat on these two topics are totally based on someone else's research of the people that I just mentioned. So I'm just representing and summarizing the work that they have done for the sake of making a comparative analysis. For that, I will give a brief summary on each of the perspectives. Um, if for any reason I say anything that might not uh, be accurate because maybe of my own ignorance because of my cultural bias or maybe because I just didn't understand something properly so please do not hesitate to call me out if I say anything that might not be true um, so I'm not re I'm recalling this knowledge not to represent or to speak on behalf of anyone else uh, especially not on the cultures and communities but rather to inspire a kind of fruitful discussion 
and exchange around these questions because these different perspectives inspired me a lot and I'm just trying to share uh, these perspectives. Um, disclaimer, over. <laughs> um, let's get into Japanese AI visions. So I've been doing this talk, I Androids the, the Better Humans, um, since like a year. I think the first time that I did it was March 2019. Uh, it was in Berlin. I remember it was part of CTM Festival, another festival that is similar to Mutic. I was using the humanoid robots as kind of a cliffhanger for introducing the perspectives on AI. In Japan, especially um, this one that we have here, um, I always found it was very catchy. Um, last year, uh, a temple in Kyoto kind of in indicted uh, a robot priest that was in the temple and was actually like giving prayers and all these kind of things. Um, so it was kind of a, a good introduction to, to be like, okay, Japan is very freaky. They have uh, robot priests. Um, but um, the main argument is basically centered around the idea and the resulting relationships um, that are inherently different in Japan than in the West. So I have to say, even though I was living in Japan, I, I think I also kind of fetishized and orientalized the Japanese AI visions um, to make them more interesting for, for the Western audience that I was talking to. Um, now in retrospect, I would say that might be true to some extent. Um, in any case, a few things that, that are noteworthy in the comparison or the main kind of difference that is always claimed is that uh, in the West, the narrative of like artificial intelligence, not only AI, but also robots and artificial life in general is always kind of surrounded in the idea of the Frankensteinian notion of this creating this artificial monster, um, which also I think has a lot to do with the idea of intelligence being something that we actually measure uh, give to human beings and with this we kind of measure the relationship of other beings towards uh, human beings and the fear that artificial beings that become more intelligent will murder us all is something that has been uh, very prevalent in western kind of thought so you can see that in like terminator and uh, transformers and all these kind of things that it's always this kind of um, very fatalistic notion of AI in the West. In contrast to this more pessimistic outlook in the West, it seems that Japan has more positive attitudes to, um, I, I call it artificial life, so it kind of, and other people call it that as well, so it kind of encompasses not only AI, but um, uh, robotics as well, and biotechnology as well, which we'll actually see later on is quite essential um, from the Japanese uh, cultural perspective. Um, that this kind of personification or objectification of an artificial being becomes quite uh, essential. Um, however, the idea of being in touch with virtual beings or artificial beings is actually quite prevalent in Japan. Um, so if you're there, um, like VR chat, for example, is huge, where you have your avatars, uh, virtual YouTubers are huge. Uh, it's so huge that HTC Vive, the VR glasses are actually sold out in Japan since a year because people are just getting so much into this avatar kind of thing. Um, if you think about mangas, uh, one of the first mangas, Astro Boy, for example, was like this friendly robot kid that is helping everyone. And of course, we have like um, these guys as well, Asimo and Aibo. Um, so the idea of this personification becomes very important when thinking about Japan. So in order to analyze it, um, it is essential to take a look at the two dominant kind of philosophies that uh, of thought in Japan, which are Shintoism and Buddhism. Um, I, it is important to note that Shintoism and Buddhism coexist in Japan and that most of Japanese people um, practice both to some extent. So that already actually says a lot about the two kind of philosophies, religions, if they coexist and if people can be both, how open uh, 
um, they are to actually adapt to new kind of um, ideas. Um, so while G Buddhism came to Japan from China in the sixth century, and it was quite sectarian um, with formal membership, um, Shintoism, which is Japan's native animistic philosophy, uh, does not really know any formal membership and is more um, an animistic uh, philosophy that is rooted in uh, the practice of uh, a lot of rituals in, in everyday life. So the core concepts of Buddhist thought that are prevalent in Japan and are relevant for our investigation are the idea that everything is connected and constantly in influencing each other, that everything and everyone is carrying the Buddha nature. So that means that everything and everyone has the possibility of reaching enlightenment and that there's no ego or self. So if we take these ideas into consideration, it is quite understandable when you think about that the head priest of the temple that we just saw in the article stated that Buddha's path can be represented by a robot, by a tree or by a human. That's what Buddhism is about after all, this he quoted as being saying. So while it might seem strange for us that there's a robot priest, actually from a Buddhist perspective, it's just a continuation of the things that have been going on before already. And that's why it might be more uh, accepted. On the other hand, if we think about Shintoism, it stay, stands for the way of the spirits. So Shin means uh, spirit and To means way. The same characters as like Judo, for example. Um, the basic concept of Shintoism is that the spirits are inhabiting all the world around us. So basically everything carries a spirit. So it doesn't matter whether it's a rock, a person or a robot. So it is interesting to think about how the idea of a spirit is interpreted because the description of what is a spirit is the spirit is the power of a phenomena to inspire a sense of awe or wonder. So this clearly shows that re relationality is very like essential to a Shinto way of seeing things. So a sense of I exist because you exist. If you don't, if you cannot inspire a sense of awe or wonder in me, do you carry a spirit? So it very much comes to, to a relational kind of uh, worldview. Um, with I, you can be animate or inanimate things. I'm not really sure how inanimate things can feel a, a, a sense of wonder or awe, uh, but maybe it's enough if I feel it towards the rock. Um, I actually have to investigate that a little more. Um, so coming out of this relationship with the spirits around us, responding, respecting, and taking care of the spirits around us is part of the natural order of things. So accepting a robot or an artificial intelligence or whatever being into, uh, in, uh, into our like group comes very natural because there's no clear distinctions. There's no real hierarchies and there's no real sense of exploitation. So I think it's quite interesting to note here that artificiality and intelligence, probably the two words that are most important about artificial intelligence in the Western discourse, actually don't really play any role in the idea of something having a spirit or not, of something being in our group or not. So that, that's quite interesting because in, in the West, intelligence is actually the, the level that we measure. Like I said, uh, the, the, the rationality of another being or the purpose of another being, um, even between us people, you know, you say, this guy is more intelligent. I'm, I'm stupid. So here, this idea of intelligence and artificiality also, the idea of something that we create is something, it's just an extension of what is existing already is quite interesting. I also find interesting the, the pers personification or the materialization of the animate and inanimate phenomena. So it really, maybe that's the, the reason why um, actually the, the body of the robot becomes so important and less the, the AI algorithms that are running the robots. That's why we have Aibo and Asimo and Astro Boy 
because it's actually the, the, the existence of a certain kind of body that becomes, becomes relevant in our relationship uh, to that. So that results actually in two concrete uh, results when we think about uh, the research um, focus, which there's a lot of research focus in Japan on human machine interaction especially with focus on emotions. So especially in, in, with focus on how, how we react emotionally to robots. And actually, um, that's also why the, the focus was more on, on robotics rather than AI. On one hand, okay, Japan is more advanced in robotics than it is in AI. But the, the, the first step to actually creating reaction to an artificial being was to create a body for that artificial being. Now that we have the body, we actually start using the AI algorithms to make the behavior of the beings more, more relevant to people and to, to make them more natural. So um, that's quite interesting to, to think about this two-step approach and how, how it actually was influenced or can be claimed to be influenced at least partially by the cultural background of Japan. Um, I think that's it for Japan for now. Um, we will get to Japan later on when we do our comparison with, uh, with the other philosophies. Uh, next on, we're going to talk about indigenous AI, unless anyone has some specific questions on, on Japanese perspectives at the moment. Just taking a quick look at the chat. Yeah, Confucianism is actually um, quite interesting because before, um, so Confucianism um, has a kind of, there's a lot of group mentality, like the, 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 communi the community is above the individual, which is also something that's to some extent true in Japan. Um, so the idea of, I, I wouldn't say that in Confucianism necessarily it has to do with having something to hide. It can be, um, but the idea of privacy itself might be something very different. So privacy, as we interpret it in the West, is a very individual kind of narrative. Like privacy is like private. Uh, it's mine. I don't want to share my data with anyone. That's the kind of privacy idea that we have in, in the Western-centric perspective. In societies that are more communal focused, this idea of privacy, that it's really like mine doesn't um, exist in that way. So if you, if, you, if you lead a discourse with the Western per perception on privacy, um, in, in China, for example, it's not only that China is like a, communist state authoritarian or whatever but the, the 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 question about privacy might be framed very differently there so i think these these are the kind of nuances that we really have to think about like when we talk about privacy are we talking about our definition of privacy or someone else's definition of privacy and understanding these cultural differences is actually uh, quite essential because they might not mean the same things in the in the same in the same cultures, and actually, that's when language becomes very uh, interesting. Uh, having learned several languages is um, especially languages like Chinese and Japanese, where you have the characters. When you dissect them, you can look at the character, and the character itself has a meaning, and the meaning comes from somewhere because it has different components in the character. You can actually better understand where that word comes from and which components it makes of. And comparing the two languages, how they would frame, for example, privacy. I don't know the Chinese word for privacy right now. I, I did before. Um, but the characters alone in the language already carry a very different meaning of privacy than we would have in the Western-centric uh, perspective. Um, 
yeah, that too. You can just make the English version. Um, Sebastian had a question. How do the ideas of seeing also in non-human things a spirit, but on the other side, seeking for a humanoid appearance work together? Do you have any explanation in that point? Um, I, I actually don't think it's about the humanoid appearance directly. It's for, first, it's the embodiment that um, giving something a body. It can also be like an abstract kind of body. A body can also be like the wind. So something that can inspire a sense of wonder in you. Humanoid appearance is, I think, more, came developed because we can relate more closely to human beings than we can do to rocks. So the, the, the level of like wonder that is inspired by us with the humanoid robot and the kind of emotions that we can give to a humanoid robot are, are greater than if I would build like a rock robot, <laughs> if that makes sense. So it's more the kind of relationship that we have to the humanoid uh, appearance uh, and the embodiment in that way. How does the conception of self and other influence the design or the framing of technology? Um, maybe we keep that question for later because I think it's not necessarily only uh, a question for Japanese visions. Um, but that's actually a question for, for other cultural visions as well. So I think we can keep that question for later if uh, someone would write it down. So we can do that in the Q&A. Oh, I'm seeing I'm already talking for an hour. I still have a little bit to go through. I think I will hurry up. So we still have time to discuss. Um, I was actually afraid that I wouldn't have enough to say, um, but usually that's not the case. Um, indigenous AI. So the first thing, again, I clearly want to mention is that there's no unified indigenous kind of perspective on artificial intelligence. In contrast, indigenous knowledge is uh, very much related to the specific territories that are home to the respective communities that have certain uh, perspectives on the world. So it's very important to make this distinction at the very beginning in order to avoid any kind of fails homogenization of the diverse cultural practices of the indigenous uh, groups around the world, um, which was also stated in the introduction statement of the indigenous protocol and artificial intelligence position paper by the indigenous protocol and artificial intelligence working group. Um, I will also send you to the link uh, to this work. It's super interesting um, to read. So there's no one indigenous perspective. Very important because in the past, and as often, especially by Western scholars, been romanticized the kind of indigenous Indian kind of character, which there is no such thing as like one um, perspective. Um, so this position paper is very interesting. Um, 20 months for 20 across 20 time zones uh, during two workshops between indigenous people from all around the world, um, including Australia, North America, the Pacific. Um, this really shows that there's no one indigenous kind of perspective in this position paper, um, which actually encompasses not only articles, but also poems and artworks um, on the, uh, from these indigenous uh, groups. Um, to actually give you a brief introduction to how indigenous knowledge can be made work in the, in the relationship to AI, I would recommend uh, to read this article. That was actually the first article that I read on indigenous uh, perspectives on artificial intelligence. It's called Making Kin with the Machines. It was an essay winning, uh, award winning essay by Jason Edward Lewis, uh, Noelani Arista, Archer Pichawis, and Suzanne Kite, who are also part of the, of the working group that we just mentioned. I'm just gonna uh, mention like a few thoughts from, from this article, but I recommend everyone who's uh, interested in this to, to read it yourself, um, because there's a lot more in there 
um, that can that can help. Um, I'm actually just going to read like a short quote from the article because I think uh, I couldn't say it any better. Um, so the beginning of the article states, North American Oceanic indigenous epistemologies tend to foreground relationality. Relationality is something that we also saw in the Japanese perspective. So Dakota philosopher Vine Deloria Jr. describes this respect as having two attitudes. One attitude is the acceptance of self-discipline by humans and their communities to act responsibly towards other forms of life. That's also the relationality that we talked before. The other attitude is to seek to establish communications and covenants with other forms of life on a mutually agreeable basis. So that's um, also relationality. When it comes to AI, the first attitude is necessary to understand the need for more diverse thinking regarding our relationship with artificial intelligence. And the second is to formulating plans for how to develop that relationship. So um, seeing this kind of way of thought is, uh, first of all, inspiring on to just take in a different uh, perspective on how, if we see things in a different way, it might uh, lead to different results. So this is kind of in a direct criticism to, to Western thought, where the following paragraph that I'm also going to read, but it's also here on the slide, um, which is kind of a general um, comparison between Western thought and a lot of indigenous epistemologies. So indigenous epistemologies do not take abstraction or generalization as a natural good or higher order of intellectual engagement. Relationality is rooted in the context and the prime context is place. There is a conscious acknowledgement that particular worldviews arise from particular territories and the ways in which the push and pull of all the forces at work in that territory determine what is most salient for existing in balance with it. So that's basically actually what we're trying to do. <laughs> so different cultural backgrounds that exist in different contexts in different parts of the world lead to different kind of perspectives and to different ways how to work. So it's quite interesting how this uh, statement actually relates very much to not only the different perspective that we're trying to analyze, but in some ways can also inspire the way how we analyze these different perspectives. So it, the, the inspiration here really works as two, two levels, uh, as a subject of investigation, but also it's an inspiration for your own mode of investigation, something that we'll also see uh, when talking about the Ubuntu perspectives. So this alone is already so much in, in, in contrast with uh, the claimed universality of Western knowledge, uh, with the claimed universality of uh, rationality, especially. Um, I would just recommend you to, these are kind of the most important points in general. Um, the article itself, though, goes into different concepts from, um, for example, the Hawaiian people, from the Plains Cree people, which are indigenous people in mostly Canada, but also in the US, and also to the Lakota indigenous people. Um, they're touching up on topics such as AI and human relations, um, the heterogeneity of AI. So there's no one AI, but there's like a multiplicity of different forms of AI, as well as the materiality of AI. So the embodiment, but also the construction. So the, the, the physicality of artificial intelligence. So I'm not going to go deeper into those topics. Whoever is interested can just read the article. Uh, super inspiring work, in my opinion. Um, I'm going to cut out the rest on indigenous AI because we don't have much time anymore, only 15 minutes, because I'm very slow today. And I'm talking a lot. I hope it's not getting boring for, for anyone. So, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. I'm not talking about the, the, the operating system, Ubuntu, but Ubuntu as a certain way of thought that originated from especially Southern uh, Africa and 
or the southern southern Africa and the southern part South Africa and the southern part of Africa. So it's kind of also going a little into Mozambique and these areas. Um, the research that I'm going to cite is by the researcher Sabelo Mblambi, as I mentioned. Um, and he wrote this great article that actually just came out, so right in time for my research. It came out a month ago. It's called From Rationality to Relationality, Ubuntu as an Ethical and Human Rights Framework for Artificial Intelligence Governance. Um, it's a great read, um, very inspiring as well. Um, recommend anyone who's interested to read it. Um, I'm just also going to give a, a quick summary on what uh, Sabelo is talking about. Um, first of all, the title says from rationality to relationality. So Sabelo puts in direct opposition the question of personhood being uh, defined by rationality, which we often do in, in the West, which also is why intelligence is such a big question when it comes to personhood, because the connection between intelli the more intelligent you are, the more rational usually are claimed to be and the more of a person you become um, it's a very individual trait so that's why individualism is so big in the in the western kind of uh, way of thinking he claims though that that's a that's a fails way to um, think about personhood because there's so much irrationality um, if rationality is like the highest form of, of personhood um, then actually no one is a real person because no one is 100% rational. That's a very important kind of distinction that he makes, especially in regard to the West. Um, Sabelo then puts this in the contrast with the relational definition of personhood um, coming from the Ubuntu philosophy. So in Ubuntu, relationality is the acceptance of the individuality of others because we're all interconnected. And in general, it is also the acceptance of the interconnectedness of humans, nature, and the spiritual. Here, it is actually a little different from kind of the Japanese perspectives in, in Shintoism, where we say everything is connected and we are all one, or similar thoughts are also in the indigenous one. But here, uh, the relationality between people is actually the main focus. So while, of course, it's also interconnectedness of humans, nature, and the spiritual, the centerpiece is the relationality between people, which is quite interesting uh, to see. It's kind of uh, somewhere in between the, the, the kind of communal uh, way of thinking that everything belongs together and we're all one and everything has a spirit and the kind of hyper-individualist of the West. It's kind of in between. Um, which we'll also see in a few quotes afterwards. So when it comes to Ubuntu and ethics, um, which is very essential for us as well, um, we measure the ethical, uh, the, the level of ethics in terms of how we relate to other beings. So if we can create meaningful relationships with others, which also means that we meet our duties towards other people, that makes us actually more ethical and that would be said as someone having Ubuntu. And the opposite would be if we don't behave in reverence of the others, um, we actually become less Ubuntu or we are not having Ubuntu, which is actually one of the harshest critics you can, uh, you can give uh, to a person. What's also interesting is that the word itself, Ubu defines as a state of being and becoming and into evokes a continuous process of being and becoming a person, um, which I also find very, very diff uh, interesting to see, especially in contrast to Western thought, um, where rationality is like the highest goal and uh, either you're rational or not. Um, and in Ubuntu, it's kind of this recreation. It's a process that every day and new, you have to kind of recreate uh, your state of being Ubuntu, of having Ubuntu. It's an ongoing cycle. Uh, so not something that stops, but something that is continuously constructed and reconstructed. And in that sense, it's quite similar to the concept of culture when we think about the definition of culture that we saw before, 
that culture is a set of meanings that we have, and then it's recreated in the actions and reinforces the set of meanings that we have. So Ubuntu is inspiring our action, and in turn, our actions are becoming more Ubuntu. I guess you could also say that it relates to karma in a sense as well. Um, but that was just a thought right now. I haven't thought about that properly enough to be able to say that. Um, Self-similarity is also an important part. We thought about that already with the relationality that the individual and the group kind of co-construct each other. And the in individual is as important as the community and only by the community and the individual recognizing each other, um, the, the group becomes kind of uh, meaningful. Um, I have a few more things on Ubuntu, but we're almost out of time. Um, so you can just read the article. <laughs> uh, it's a great article. Um, he goes further into some concrete criticisms of current modes of um, how uh, AI is employed, especially uh, um, in like a decolonial um, kind of perspective. Um, I would have loved to introduce that to you, but um, you should just read the article yourself. Um, I think it's more important that we went to the kind of uh, thought uh, systems. Um, I'm going to skip this. Okay. Eight minutes. Um, quick comparative analysis on what we just uh, heard. I know it was a lot. I talked for almost one and a half hours, Jesus Christ. Um, but I'm just going to leave you with uh, some comparative uh, thoughts. So I find it quite interesting to see that all three of these perspectives are grounded in some degree of relationality, which are all in stark contrast to the individualism kind of that we have in Western centric thought. Um, so while Japanese relationality is more found in the idea of everything carrying a spirit and all of us living in the same world together, which can also be found in indigenous perspectives, the Ubuntu relationality is really more focused on the the, the relationship of the people to each other and especially of the individual to the group um, and then in second kind of role as the individual to the environment and to the spiritual this also becomes uh, clear when the ubuntu phrase is said a person is a person through other persons that's a famous saying in the ubuntu kind of philosophy uh, that makes this distinction very clear so Relationality is one big one. The other question that I found interesting in investigating uh, these different cultural backgrounds is the idea of the materialization of AI. So when we have in the Japanese visions, the idea of the spirit of the soul, um, this quickly leads to a personification, especially when we think about a spirit being something that inspires a sense of wonder in someone else. It becomes very much about embodiment embodiment but in an abstract way so like wind can also be an embodiment uh, of something um the materialization of ai in for example in indigenous uh, thought is also quite uh, important uh, lakota was one that we uh, were talking about before um as something that needs to be acknowledged but more in the sense of all the different parts that come together to form ai so um, while in Japanese thought it might be more like the, the being as a separate being in the Lakota thought, um, it's actually the materialization of the different things that come together to make AI what it is that becomes important as building the body of AI. So in Western thought, the embodiment of AI also often plays a role, um, especially as the question of intelligence is closely connected to like us humans beings that have a body and that's why we all in the west often have this kind of freakish uh, idea when we create artificial uh, beings um, that have intelligence and might murder us all um, in ubuntu the thought of embodiment and materialization doesn't seem to have uh, doesn't seem to be a defining or prominent feature in the sense of like something having like uh, AI, like having intelligence on this question, it's rather becoming like a working kind of principle when it comes to like more decolonial approaches. Uh, the exploitation 
uh, behind the materialization of AI, for example, data colonialism and surveillance capitalism, um, as Sabelo also mentions in his article. Um, finally, I'm also thinking about the relationship uh, to power, especially in more practical terms. Um, so I think it's important to compare in which kind of environment this knowledge or these perspectives actually exist. Uh, the Western thought system is definitely the one that is currently globally dominant um, way of seeing the world. Not that I'm saying that everyone thinks that way, but in the mainstream narratives, it's definitely the one that kind of um, is the most prominent and deeply ingrained, especially when we talk about technological uh, development. Japanese perspectives, I think it's important to note that uh, there is the Japanese nation. <laughs> so uh, there's actually a way that Japanese perspectives are made to work through Japan. It's not super prominent, but it's definitely uh, inspiring and definitely also had some impact on uh, is the countries surrounding Japan, also the ones that might have been colonized, like uh, Taiwan uh, and South Korea, but also in like this kind of pop cultural discourse, Japan had a, a lot of influence. Um, for the indigenous uh, perspectives, um, it's quite interesting to see that it's actually a global network of communities that are coming together uh, to promote their different uh, views of knowledge, but um, they're very much rooted in their local territory and it really depends on where these communities lie on how much influence they actually have on, on the power structures and on making decisions in their respective environment and how that relates to, to uh, the global governance of artificial intelligence. Um, for Ubuntu, uh, it has been quite prevalent in, in Southern Africa um, and actually has been part of the political discourse there. So if we think, for example, after apartheid, that the South African state was um, actually uh, developed uh, together in unison between the formerly the former oppressors and the formerly oppressed. Um, and there was kind of a, um, a peace process between the formerly oppressed and the former oppressors. Um, that's actually part of the Ubuntu philosophy. Um, the idea that um, everyone needs to have the chance to become part of the community again, which is very different to the, the idea of punishment after, after, like, um, after debate or after uh, uh, fighting. Um, it is also interesting to see how the different cultural perspectives are made to work. So when it comes to Japanese perspective, it often, especially in the West, is more like it's a curiosity. Um, and as also in Japan, it doesn't really spark a concrete agenda, at least not directly. Not, it's not like the Japanese politicians or the Japanese society sees it in a way, okay, we think like robots are awesome and we love Astro Boy, so we're going to make our whole agenda that way. It's more like a subconscious way of seeing the world that has such a huge impact of course but it's not like not very actively promoted in that sense um, apart from pop culture uh, maybe on the other hand uh, the the indigenous perspectives uh, and also ubuntu are like philosophies that are seem to be actively promoted by the communities that share these thoughts so we see in the when you read the articles about indigenous ai but also about the ubuntu uh, AI perspectives. It really is made uh, on one hand as a criticism of, of Western thought in that in that context, but also really in, in creating a different narrative and a different mode of operation, um, kind of trying to, to give alternatives to, to the mainstream kind of way of doing things. Um, so this, I think, are all important uh, thoughts that are important. Uh, essential to think about when it comes to power relations and which kind of environments do these different cultures and perspectives work, how much influence they have, um, etc. Okay, I think I'm almost done. Um, I have a great conclusion, maybe not. I think it's, 
the the comparative kind of small analysis that I tried to do is uh, is only like a very very first attempt, uh, and it also was meant to be more inspirational for the people that were joining to think about these different cross cultural differences that we have in values and assumptions and priorities that might be relevant to to artificial intelligence and uh, the governance. Uh, of AI and how to think about to incorporate um, these different perspectives in the future. Um, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. This is a very early stage. You can also see that the perspectives that we discussed are also at the very early stage of, of their own research. So cross-cultural comparison is even uh, behind that. Um, things that need to be done and that we're also trying to do with our project in AI for People is start gathering these different perspectives, start creating a repository. We have our big reading list, um, but we want to expand the kind of knowledge that we have and working together with researchers that are interested in, in Ubuntu, in indigenous AI, but there's also people that think about Christian AI, for example. Um, I'm not much aware about what's going on in, in India, for example, but I know we have a lot of Indian uh, participants uh, in, this, in this group. So I would be very interested to hear if there's any research that kind of uh, brings Indian culture in relationship to, to AI. Um, so that, that's the first step of our project, to kind of create a repository of all these different perspectives and then slowly start uh, exploring where there might be intersections in this kind of comparative analysis that, that we did um, today. And then of course, um, we want to make it practical. So having a repository and thinking about all these different perspectives is nice, um, but we want to use them uh, in the future in order to make better decisions, which will be um, also one of the goals of the, of the project that we're doing for AI for People. Um, I'm not a, a very technical person or I, I like to think in concepts and philosophical uh, perspectives. So if there's anyone that has more experience with, um, with making things more practical, I would be happy to hear your thoughts. Um, the projects are open for people to join. Um, you can just shoot me an email or shoot AI for people an email if you're interested. You can join us on Slack for further discussions. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think we will have much time for questions. I would love to discuss though. I think the next talk is starting at quarter to four though. So it might be a little difficult. Uh, I'm sorry I took a long time. I hope people are not asleep yet. Um, yeah, what can I say? support us, follow us on social media, um, join one of our projects as set. Um, you can also make a donation if you, if you enjoyed uh, the workshops. Um, yeah, maybe we have time for one question, two questions. What does Master Phil say? One, okay. I think we had one question before, right? Summary of questions, markets. Okay, I think the humanoid question we answered already. How does the conception of self and other influence the design or framing of technology? Um, I think that's, a, that's an interesting question, especially thinking about it from these different cultural uh, perspectives. So if you think uh, about Ubuntu, as we just saw, if the relationality, if there's a self-reinforcing cycle between like uh, me and the community, um, is there really a self and another? Um, aren't we just all one? Maybe that's a Western way of thinking, thinking about self and other in the framing of, of technology. Japanese might also beg to, to defer if the, the whole world is one and we're all just like uh, uh, inspire, inspiring awe in each other. Um, is that the relationship between the self and the other? So there's many ways to, to think about it. And I think these questions 
uh, why different cultures are are so interesting to to discuss. And I'm not claiming I'm like I'm overwhelmed with all these cultural perspectives because I don't know which one to choose as right or wrong. They all inspire me in, in, to see things in different ways, and I think that's that's at least for me the best that I can do. Um, and I don't want to decide either. I have to say so. Anyways, I think we finish it here because it's super hot. Um, and uh, I talked a lot and I think you're tired of my voice, maybe. Uh, the meeting is also recorded. So if it was too much information, we'll put it on YouTube and you can just watch it afterwards. And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, feel free. I'm looking forward to hearing more from you and uh, have a good day.